Thank you, Suzanne. So we have a panel that we're assembling of uh, different researchers and uh, managers to give folks an update on where we are. So um, the first speaker who we have this morning is uh, Lisa Keith with USDA. Okay, I'd just like to give um, thanks to my great lab crew and the great work that they do, uh, Lionel, Wade, Blaine, and Mark. And I thought before we actually got started in rapid ohia death, I would just try to explain as a plant pathologist and as a newly discovered disease, uh, how we go about and attack a problem. We're really trying to figure out what it is, how bad it is, and how can we manage it. And so for plant pathologists, one of the key principles is the disease triangle, which is the example on the right. And you have to have a fungus, uh, in this case, ceratocystis. It's a pathogen capable of causing the disease. You have to have a susceptible host, and in this case, it's ohia. And then you also have to have a favorable environment. And while that seems like a very simple triangle um, process, there's actually many, many parts. And everything has to work in coordination to actually get disease. So if there's a way to minimize or eliminate a part of this triangle, you can start to manage the problem. Uh, we've now defined the symptoms, which are actually how Ohia is responding to the fungal infection of ceratocystis. Um, symptoms include the rapid browning of the leaves, and the leaves remain attached to the tree. Um, you see complete foliar death. Um, it seems to happen quite rapidly, hence the name rapid ohia death, within a matter of weeks. Um, ultimately, there are dead trees, and the trees are not actually coming back after attack by the fungal pathogen ceratocystis. There's also the signs, or actually the, the fungus itself, present inside the wood. And these are examples that you see the discoloration of the wood, and also sometimes this fruity smell, kind of a banana smell. Um, ceratocystis species uh, A is similar to things causing uh, canker stain of plane trees um, on the mainland and in Europe, and similar to an isolate found on Syngonium. Um, this is very different from a pre-existing ceratocystis that causes black rot of sweet potatoes that had been here since the 40s, and then another species which actually um, is similar genetically to something found um, here in Hawaii and also in Indonesia. So when you take information like this, um, these are kind of the bullet points to what we're finding. So there are two new species of ceratocystis that were isolated from these dead ohia trees. Okay, They have not been found elsewhere. So to kind of give you just a geographical picture, the exact pathway of how it got here is unknown. But here with Hawaii, um, one of the species, um, when it's grouped um, by related species elsewhere in the world and on different hosts and trees and, and plants, crops, um, one is very similar coming from the Latin America or Caribbean. Um, and another one is actually from Asia, okay? So we do know that. Um, we're still trying to figure out what plants carry this in, and that's to stop um, any future introductions of these invasive species. Once you understand the symptoms, you always find these fungi. You have to go about these steps to actually prove that the fungus is causing disease. And you do that in the laboratory, and you start with that pure culture of the fungus. Okay, That's what it is growing on a plate. You can take healthy seedlings. You wound them a certain way. And this is just the stepwise progression of what we do. When you looked inside, you now see that typical discoloration, and you can re-isolate the pathogen. You've now proven the pathogenicity. And this is proof that the fungus, these two ceratocystis species, um, which were commonly called A and B in our lab, are causing rapid ohia death. 
Okay, so as time goes on and you do a lot more um, investigation into the field, you're really trying to get a better handle on symptoms that you see. Um, with these two species, ultimately you end up seeing dead canopies of trees, okay? They're very similar. They're hard to tell apart at this stage. But as you start looking inside the wood, you can see the streaking pattern of one is a little darker. Pay attention to the types of spores you're finding. Sometimes it's more short-lived spores, um, and other times it's very environmentally resistant spores. So these can survive a long time, a couple years after trees die. As far as the catch-all phrase, rapid ohia death, but we're also scientifically defining these two new diseases, okay? Um, species A is real typical for what um, ceratocystis wilt is in trees, and the other one right now, it's more of this rapid or quick decline, okay? So they're different scientifically, but ultimately under that umbrella of rapid ohia death. Um, are wounds necessary? How much of a wound? You know, is it something very simple? Does it have to be a hurricane strength um, force wind? Um, how many spores or those little um, fungal propagules, again, have to get in to start an infection? We're trying to determine the cause and effects of the disease outbreak, ultimately to develop strategies to intervene, okay? Uh, hopefully your basic microbiology culturing fungi in the laboratory can take a long time. And so one of the big developments was actually using that genetic information to create a very specialized test. Um, and from a two to four week turnaround time to figure out, uh, to diagnose as the fungus present in this, in this sample, now within 24 hours, um, we can now say ceratocystis is killing the tree. Everything's going towards management and sanitation and doing the testing to make sure that when you're using rubbing alcohol, it's killing the fungus. And if you try to use simple green, it's not going to be effective at killing the fungus. We know kiln drying will kill the pathogen, but maybe air drying, which doesn't reach the inside, uh, now spores are gonna be viable and you can move that infected wood around. Um, unfortunately, uh, with rapid ohia death and many other tree diseases, there's no silver, bu silver bullet. Um, there's no cure, but ultimately we're really trying to stop the short and long distance spread of ceratocystis. This is the latest distribution map, okay? Um, we all heard the, the unfortunate news of the point up here in Lapahoyhoy, but as you can see, um, initial testing really confirmed death and dying of trees in the Pune district and South Hilo. Dr. Gordon Bennett, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii, uh, Department of Plant Environmental Protection Sciences. And our research is focusing mostly on um, the role of insects. So we're tackling one of those triangular points that Lisa mentioned. Uh, so what we know is that disease can be spread a number of ways, uh, and this includes things like moving infected wood for fire, for construction, even waste disposal. What we're particularly interested in are the insects because uh, Hawaii is host to a really dominant and abundant group of insects that associate with ohia, and particularly in ohia forests. And one of the major groups we're interested in are these wood boring beetles because they can come into direct contact with the disease and they're super abundant and they're very small and you can imagine a dead tree here that is a substrate that the beetles are actually drawn to attacking. One of the major groups we're specifically focusing in on are these uh, what's considered ambrosia beetles and these are very abundant tiny insects that attack ohia. Uh, in the native environment, and there's, they can come into contact with the disease in these radial stains that Lisa had talked about, and when they come in, there's two major ways that they sort of contact the tree, and one of them you can think of sort of like apartment shopping, and what they do is they go and they'll, they'll probe the tree short distances, which can, can release spores into the environment or come into contact with the disease. When they pick a suitable tree that they actually want to live in, they'll set up a home, or what we consider, uh, we call galleries, and they'll live in there for months, and after they've done breeding and rearing their, their uh, offspring, they can emerge in the hundreds and then go and spread in the environment. So a super abundant, very important possible transmission mechanism. So if these beetles attack the trees, how are they able to release the disease into the environment? And there's a couple of really important ways that we're thinking about, and one is the beetles themselves can go on to spread it to trees, um, possibly by carrying the disease on their exoskeleton or when they chew through the wood in their gut. 
Um, but they also create this uh, substrate called boring dust, which as they tunnel, they release all these small, small particles, and this can be caught up in the wind and can disperse throughout the island, or it can fall into the soil where human activities or animal activities could pick it up and move it through uh, different forests, even short distances or long distances, posing severe risks. To address this question, we got busy trying to figure out what species are specifically attacking Ohia. Um, we made these collections at all the major sites where the disease has been popping up, including some of the most recent areas uh, in coordination with what Lisa has identified uh, as important areas. So just to give you some brief overview of what we found, basically those insects that are attacking Ohia come down to just a few species and really one dominant species in these environments. This is super dominant species in all these forests where we've looked across the islands, uh, just dominating the attack on that. And the, all these species, for the most part, that you see making up this biggest uh, chunk here, this is the species, all the species we collected in the environment. This is just what we found directly from Ohia. Um, they're invasive species that have been here for a long time, and they're some of the most widespread introduced species in the globe. Some of these we don't even know their native range anymore because they've just been spread throughout the, the world so, so much. Uh, so now that we've identified the species, we're interested in testing, addressing the question, do they actually carry the disease with them when they're leaving uh, the trees? So we've been taking and sampling our beetles and using the same molecular detection technique so we can squish the beetles and process them the same way that uh, Lisa was just discussing. And then we can look to see if they actually test positive. And then from that, that we want to understand, uh, okay, so they have it. Is it infective? Can we rear it? And that would be, if we can plate it and get it to grow, that's a good proxy for understanding whether or not they can infect trees. Uh, so to date, even though this is preliminary, we're increasing our sampling. We've 10% of the beetles we've tested are actually carrying uh, measurable spore loads. <clears throat> so we're simultaneously looking at this boring dust because as these beetles attack trees by the hundreds, they produce this dust, uh, and the boring dust does contain fungal spores, and Lisa Keith has done quite a bit of work as sort of a prelude to what we're doing now to identify that. Uh, and depending on where you go and how, uh, the number of trees you sample, up to 50 to 75% of the samples in a forest can test positive for the disease. Um, so the boring dust is a really important consideration for controlling the disease in this case. Um, and some work that Lisa has done is, yes, you can actually culture the disease from the boring dust. So it's not only there and abundant, but it's also uh, potentially viable. Now that we know this, that this, the, uh, the boring dust is a particularly effective uh, mechanism to spread, we've been working with a few collaborators, including uh, Carter Atkinson at the USGS, to actually look to see and model how the disease could be spread in the wind. So you can imagine um, a tree that's sort of just sticking out in the wind, that's dead, and the beetles are attacking it. Um, we affectionately call this the boring dust tower, because as wind blows through, it will carry these fine particles uh, throughout the environment. And we're trying to develop models to look at the likelihood of how the disease can be spread this way, but also how far it can go. Uh, and one of the cues we're taking is from uh, approaches that people have taken with a coffee berry borer, which is actually a closely related species that attacks, uh, as another sort of bark beetle or ambrosia beetle type that attacks coffee beans. Um, and we can use some of the management and control strategies, such as control elements that they've used there, and apply them to the disease here. And we've also been working with uh, Dofla and Steve Birchfeld, who we'll hear from shortly, um, about trying to inform management decisions and tree felling activities to control the disease in certain forested areas. Uh, so this is an active area that we're just starting to get involved in right now. Um, but it's important to stress that uh, rapid ohia death is a new disease to the islands. It's a new challenge. Um, the activity of the research that's been going on has been really important in understanding the biology, ecology, and management of this disease, also understanding how it spreads. Um, so it's important to consider these elements, and as such, we've identified a few areas where we'll be going next to keep um, the research uh, going and how we can use it to improve uh, and implement management strategies and adapt to what we find in the research realm. I like to joke around and tell jokes and talks often. Um, I, I often, when I'm giving talks about this disease, I have a hard time doing that um, because, unfortunately, it's not really a joking matter. Um, this uh, initial slide shows a map of the Big Island with the distribution of Ohia in green. Um, and the current, as best as we know, distribution of either confirmed uh, raw disease or um, symptomatic trees that we need to check. 
Um, this is not quite up to date, but, but close. And um, what, what I wanted to, to talk about today was our uh, establishment and some of the results from our uh, forest plot network, um, our network of, of forest monitoring plots. So this just gives you an example of uh, what, the, what our forest plots look like. They're circular, they're about a quarter acre in size. Um, what we do is we, uh, when we establish the plot, um, we look for areas where, where we have confirmed cases of, of the disease. So uh, one tree, several trees that have the disease. Um, we measure every, the DBH species and status, whether living or dead, of those trees in the plot. Um, so we do that when we establish it. When we come back, we come back a year later. Um, we're trying to do these annually. We may increase the frequency if, if need be. Um, and we do the same thing, measure, measure all the trees in the plot, measure whether they're alive or dead. And from that, we can um, get a handle on the rate of death, of mortality of Ohia in, in those plots. So for instance, in this hypothetical plot, we had four dead Ohia trees. Uh, a year later, we had uh, 14 or so uh, dead Ohia trees. Um, so you take that change, you divide it by the total number of trees on the plot, of Ohia trees on the plot, and that gives you an annual rate of mortality. So we've done this across, um, I think, a total of 52 plots. And <clears throat> our current most recent information about morta annual mortality, that is the number of trees that are dying every year on a plot, on average, um, from all those plots, the average is 11% is per year. So we have a mortality rate of 11% per year. What that means is that every year, if we have a, an Ohia stand of 100 trees, um, Every year we're seeing 11 of those trees die, and then 11 more the next year, and then 11 more. So, so if, if that pattern is consistent um, through time, we'd expect to see the majority of those trees dead within a decade. Um, that's on average. That's, that's an average of all the plots that we have. Um, there's a very broad amount of variation uh, in that rate, um, some, some forest plots, we see very little or no um, death and change in the mortality. We'll just have a single or two rod trees um, that have died, and then we won't see next year, we won't see them anymore. Um, on the other hand, we have some plots where the mortality rate is as high as 40, 44%. And so we've seen in those plots over the course of a couple of years, almost all of the trees die. Um, some of that... Uh, pattern, some of those patterns of mortality, that variation of mortality, uh, Greg alluded to that, the, that smaller, the, that forest stands on younger flows, smaller stature stands seem to have lower rates of mortality. And we, we can see that in that, in this small, this breakout of the smaller stature forest. In comparison to the large stature forest where we're seeing um, higher, higher rates than average, about 13, 14, uh, 14 percent uh, average annual mortality in those larger forest stands. And we, we don't exactly know why that is. We see the pattern. Greg sees the pattern. Um, and it could be, again, because of soil factors. It could be the stature of the trees catching more spores. It could be uh, young trees don't have any, as many wound points as the older trees, something like that. Or it could be some combination of that. That's something that we still need to figure out. And we're working hard um, to do so um, with the resources we have. So that was kind of uh, Christmas Carol Dickens' Uh, the ghost of Christmas present. This is the ghost of Christmas future. Um, if we're seeing mortality spread across these forests and seeing it uh, manifest itself fully, what we would expect to see from our inventory plot work where um, we know that Ohia trees are the dominant um, trees and the dominant contributors to both um, basal area and the mass of those forests. They are, they are the big trees, they are the massive trees, they contain the biomass of those forests. What we would expect to see is a loss of about three quarters of the biomass from those forests. So if rod manifests itself fully, we'd expect to see forests that are about 25 percent um, of what they are now, today. Um, smaller forest, scrubbier forest, 
much more weed dominated forest. We'd obviously be losing the um, native habitat, the native diversity that Ohia provides in so many different ways. And so um, this is kind of the worst case scenario, these two photos. This, is a, this was a gem of a for, lowland wet forest in Puna. Um, this, I think this photo was taken in 2006. This is what it looks like today, just um, massive mortality. Basically, it's a sea of Ohia skeletons. And this is what we're desperately trying to avoid, both across the uh, healthy forests of the Big Island, of which 90% of the forests are still remain healthy, um, and obviously on the other islands as well. Um, that's why it's so important to develop the control measures, the protection measures, to take care of these forests as best we can, because we really cannot afford to lose them. And, and if, if we allow this, this disease to continue at this pace, this is what we, should, we would expect. So that's all I have. Thank you. Aloha and good morning. My name is Steve Bergfeld. I'm with Division of Forestry and Wildlife based in Hilo. OK, this first picture is a picture of Lower Hilo Watershed. And I just want to demonstrate the size of the forest on the Big Island that um, we need to do the surveys on. Um, it can be difficult and challenging to identify rapid trees that may have been killed by rapid Ohia death. As you've, as you've heard, there's many different ways that Ohia trees die. Uh, in the center, there's a couple trees that show symptoms of rapid Ohia death, as well as here on the side. You also see a lot of other dead trees in the background. A lot of those were killed in, starting in 2000, 2013 by the koa looper, which is a native moth that swept through this area probably two or three times. This is a page out of our incident action plan. And this is a document that we normally generate for wildland fires, natural disaster response. And we outline four goals for Division of Forestry and Wildlife as far as our management response. And it basically outlines who is responsible for what within our, our division. First, we want to slow the spread of rapid Ohia death north along the Hamakua coast and into Kohala. Continue outreach to the public. Conduct aerial surveys to detect new disease outbreaks. Follow up ground surveys and collect samples to verify the disease presence. Lastly, we want to provide for worker and public safety when we're doing our management activities. Uh, we're also working on an incident action plan involving all the different participants, uh, not just DOFOS, so that we can organize a unified command. Okay, this map shows the dish is a rapid Ohia death survey that was done in January of 2016. It shows the digital mobile sketch mapping, which basically was uh, a couple guys up in the helicopter flying with like an iPad and drawing on top of the iPad. We want to conduct the island-wide surveys every 6 to 12 months, and also the uh, aerial surveys in Hamakua, North Kona, and Kohala every 3 to 6 months. Those are areas where the disease wasn't present until uh, the Lapoyoi detection. This is our rapid response plan. The pink area shows areas that there was no rod present until, like I just mentioned, the Lapoyoi site. Um, the idea is to go in and do surveys every three to six months, identify potential rod trees, sample those trees to verify the disease, send those um, samples to Dr. Keith's lab. And then four, the fourth thing we would do is um, decide on what type of treatment is necessary in coordination with research. It's really important that management activities work with the research. We're learning a lot about the disease and what is effective and what isn't by um, working with the researchers on this. You can see a couple guys taking samples on the lower right, uh, Dr. Phil Cannon from the Forest Service and Dr. Tom Harrington from Iowa State University. So these are uh, some pictures of beetle frass on rod infected trees or boring dust. And this was taken in Lava Tree State Park. So you can see this is kind of what we're trying to prevent spread. 
the idea is that this gets airborne and deposited on uninfected trees, and that may cause infection on some of those uh, unhealthy trees. So this is our treatment map. On the lower left, we have the upper Wailuku site. And the lower right, we have the lower Wailuku site. And then now, unfortunately, we have another site in Lapoihoi. These areas are on the leading edge of outbreaks of the Rapidohia death with a high concentration of rod trees. So the idea is to reduce the amount of frass that's blowing into healthy forests to reduce the um, or minimize the possibility of further spread. So the hypothesis that we're working under for our management activities is something that Dr. Tom Harrington of Iowa State University came up with, and he's a ceratocystis expert. Major wind events twisted exposed trees and created minor openings in the trees that allow for infection by the accumulated frass or boring dust, which was deposited on the trees by the prevailing wind. So following this, our treatment generally is to fell trees. And why? Why do we want to fell trees? The tall trees with the boring dust or frass are more likely to spread rod because they are in the wind, up in the wind. The frass from trees on the ground will wash off onto the ground and are less likely to become airborne. Down trees generally decay quicker. Sometimes we'll tarp these down trees if there's just a few of them. And the idea is to reduce beetle activity as well as increase the decay rate. We rank our treatment sites by the current and predicted levels of production of infected frass, the age of the mortality of the ohia, and the beetle population in those trees. Also, the height above the ground of frass production, exposure to the prevailing winds, and the distance from healthy forests. So this is a picture of the Upper Wailuku treatment site, it's roughly 5,000 eleva feet elevation at the top of Hilo watershed. And it adjoins the pasture areas, Department of Hawaiian Homelands property. And if you look, there's uh, trees that have been killed by raw, verified over here in March 2016. So we got in in April, um, up in the air taking pictures and identified how feasible the treatment was going to be. And this is a picture in a slide you saw earlier, but it shows um, Dr. Curtis Ewing, we worked with closely on this, and also Dr. Keith. And he has some frass and sawdust traps that you see in the foreground here. And you see some trees on the side that we felled. We felled roughly 75 trees in this area. This, as a side note, this is gorse that we're poisoning and trying to keep from spreading into the forest. Like I mentioned how important it is to work with the researchers on this, Dr. Ewing, um, through his research, found that there wasn't a lot of beetle activity in these dead ohia trees. Even though they were killed by rod, there wasn't a lot of beetle activity, so thus there wasn't a lot of frass being produced. So if there's no frass really being produced from those trees, it doesn't make a lot of sense to cut them down. So we moved our uh, management activity to the lower Wailuku site. So that's what it looked like in June. So within a month, we went in and removed 75% of the trees. So we felled 90 out of 120. Some of them we couldn't fell because they were on the steep slopes and we couldn't safely cut them down. October, we went back in and retreated and cut another 38 trees of trees that had died since we went in in June. Okay, unfortunately, this is a picture of the recently identified um, rod tree in Lapoihoi, November 17th, Ryan Peroy from UH Hilo, and he went up the following day with a drone and flew roughly 200 acres around this tree. He identified 15 other trees that he thought might be potentially rod in that area. So we've had, I know people from Dr. Key's lab have been out doing um, testing as well as DOFA has had people going out and trying to find, locate these trees on the ground and take samples to verify whether or not that is actually um, rapid ohia death that killed those trees. So lastly, I just wanted to mention that there's been a huge collaboration of effort between a lot of different agencies, a lot of private individuals, and that for us to continue these efforts and ramp it up as it's spreading is we're going to have to increase capacity somehow, which 
means increasing capacity to test, analyze, monitor, treat, and educate.